Today, we will dive into something that actually I started pondering a bit about after I met today's guest, Frederick, for, for the first time. And we started talking about this. How do you actually build that relationship with your, with your customers? Because we are in, in raw sea right now in business and the world, especially in hospitality. So how do we actually get people to drive repeat business with us? And how do we actually do that through the relationship we build both when they're in our restaurants, shops, whatever it is that we're running, and then how we actually connect with them outside again. And how do we actually do it in a very authentic way? Because I think that, that that's another question to ask. That and building loyalty is what we're going to be discussing today. So. I have found, I think, an expert on this area. When you when you hear him, you will find out that he knows a lot around solving the loyalty problem and actually thereby the relationship problem with your customers. So welcome to the show, Frederick. I'm really looking forward to dive into the things which we, we have talked a bit about online, but really sharing this with the audience because I think it's critical as part of growing your business right now that you actually work with what you have. Absolutely. Well, great to be on the show, Michael, especially after seeing some of my fantastic industry friends or people who I, you know, follow quite closely have already been and shared some great knowledge. So it's a pleasure to be here. Can you, Frederick, give us a bit of background and context to, you know, your journey and what led you to solve, you know, loyalty challenges with uh, Embargo, the platform you're delivering to hospitality? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I can also start how I got into hospitality in the first place. Because yeah. I think it's it's a deep passion for the industry that led me then to build a solution for it. I moved to London when I was 19, you know, fresh out of high school with a big dream to make something great in London, one of the most exciting cities in the world. Naturally, whilst I started uni, I wanted to have also a job on the side to pay my rather high bills in London, as we all know. And uh, yeah, my first job, real job, was actually Joe and the Juice. But it was mm. slightly different, Joe, and the juice that you know now. It only had four stores in London, quietly days. And to be honest, that was when I really fell in love with what hospitality is. It was a brand that I thought had unbelievable potential. We see it today. Obviously, a major success globally. But back then, in London especially, I didn't really know the operations elsewhere. It was, you know, four stores open. There was no marketing, no real marketing tools. They were opening the store with a strong product, interesting vibe, very cool branding and, and the whole concept of the brand, but no much more. Mm. And first thing that I really loved about industry is how much consumer facing that is. I mean, I can't really think of many others where you interact so much with customers, but also how much those customers are down to, you know, being there in store and returning. Ultimately, 99.9% .9 of revenues from all of those businesses, whether you're a coffee shop, juice bar, bakery, restaurant, comes from consumers. And, and, and that really hit me. I grew up in a family, I mean, of entrepreneurs. My, ma, my, uh, my dad had a marketing agency as well, more focused on sports, marketing and management, but still. So I've always tried to look at businesses from a wider perspective, looking at it from the marketing perspective, customer relationships, et cetera. And after I fell in love with the industry itself, where I think it, it, it's a magical experience where whatever you do, you get pretty fast feedback because you can see exactly, especially when you're there, that person serving, that you're serving their coffee, you can see how people react. You can see if, if they sit down with a smile, you can, you can see how they talk about the product, maybe, you know, social media or, or just to the friends that they arrive with. It's, it's a very quick feedback loop that you maybe don't get in many other businesses. But with that being said, I, I, I sort of, as I continue to, to, to take new roles in that industry. I then worked more in the sort of late night bars, restaurants, clubs side of things, actually being a head of marketing eventually at the age of 21, I've learned that, you know, excuse my language, we were swimming naked as a marketing manager quite often in many hospitality businesses, although, you know, we have our role to market to people, to build relationships with people. There's, I realize there are very little tools to actually do that. It felt like. We can build relationships with customers when they're in store, when they're in the venue. We would spend tremendous amount of effort, money, and time to train our teams to make sure they know how to look after regulars, give them some allowance to give them some free drinks, free items, all discounts, those typical random act of kindness gestures. 
we, we looked after them to make sure they get the right training when it comes to customer service, but it always felt a little bit limited. It felt limited to whether that member of staff stays long enough. It was limited whether that member of staff is able to do that extra during service, especially when at the end of the day, we also need to make money. And when it's busy, the busier it gets, the less time it is to probably provide that extra value to the consumer. But eventually I also realized that when I would come back next day to the office and really think about it, marketing, my first question would always be, who are my important, my most important customers? And usually that question was really hard to answer. I knew the type of customers. I knew we have regulars. I knew we had people who lived in the area, worked in the area, you know, later the more bars side, we knew we had a lot of great spenders who, who would always celebrate the big days at work or, or personal or family stuff to bring their clients and, and colleagues uh, to, 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 to our venues. But I didn't really have a straightforward, a database or tool who would tell me, great, I rely on X amount of customers who drive Y amount of business. And as general research shows, it's usually the regulars, the returning customers who drive them up to 80% of revenues in hospitality businesses, but not only. But the next thing was, how can I actually build that relationship? What else can I do when those customers are not in my venue? Is there anything I can actually do to reach, reach out to them? Is there any way I can collect valuable data, qualified data? And, and do I have any tools that can allow me to use that data? Because just having, you know, an Excel sheet with, with million email addresses, half of them fake, actually doesn't really drive my business. And, and all of these questions, all of these challenges, I guess, were clouding in my head uh, more and more. And I felt, you know, great, we have Instagram, great, we have some social media inbounds, great, we, we have a little bit of email captured from, from our Wi-Fi, from our um, email addresses, uh, from our booking system. That's all great. But I still felt it's not really focused on those key customers that we care about. I still felt like a lot of that data is not really qualified. And I still felt the tools I had in place to actually use that data had significant sort of limitations or challenges. So I think, I think that sort of that law for hospitality, law for the customer facing element of it, law for the fact that actually our job is to make customers come to the menu and return, ideally with their friends and colleagues, that although it then comes into a lot of technicalities, it is a, a pretty straightforward sort of mission and vision, what we have to do as a marketeer, as, a, as an owner. I still felt there's a huge gap in the market in terms of how do we bring products that can help achieve those goals. And then, yeah, that, that, that's how it all started. I think what also helped is meeting my business partner. He was also the key driver of, of, of that idea of, of actually that idea to crystallize, of that idea to come, to come true. He was a regular customer at one of the businesses I was head of marketing of. So he, on one hand, had a great, incredible experience in the top investment banks, looking after huge consumer, consumer centric, consumer facing companies, you know, taking them to IPO, et cetera. So he, he's seen how it's done on the top level on like, you know, the biggest industries, the biggest businesses in the world. And he saw the difference that he gets as a consumer, let's say of an airline brand or hotel brand versus how, what his experience is of a customer of a SME hospitality business. So. You know, I think my own challenges and my own thoughts combined with his sort of view, how this should be done, could be done and seeing the market opportunity as well. And the difference, especially as a consumer, I guess, married <laughs> and, 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 and then, and then brought to life the, the original idea of embargo. I really like one thing I, I've noticed for the first time we, we talked as well is this, I call it the Pareto example of 20% that gives 80%. You know, the 20% of your customer that drives 80% of your revenue, your profitability or whatever it is. And actually that question is not very often asked in business. Uh, we talk about it with time management. I often heard how you do that. And actually I, I was some years ago, I read a book by, I've had, we had it in the newsletters here a lot of time with, from Richard Koch. People is watching the video now and show this book is a, a must read for, for any business leader because Absolutely. It goes through, you know, your, your 2080 rule and, and your strategy with your customers, your profitability, and like asking yourself those questions or looking for the answers to that question. 
because yeah. actually then you're focusing on the right things because we all have limited resources, and especially in hospitality where it's difficult now. So you only have limited resources when it comes to staff, money, food. So you really want to make sure you're utilizing that in the best, best possible ways. So I really like that you really, that was actually how you actually focused to build, build the platform. 100%. I would love to dig into it also deeper later, but I think one of the most eye-opening data piece that we see on our platform is that a lot of extremely successful brands that we'll probably know, maybe a lot of the listeners visit, going through the first, say, 50, 100,000 transactions in our platform, you very often realize that uh, I'd say 80, 90% of those transactions come sometimes, or sometimes like even 95, 97% in some extremes, come from a few hundred of people. Few hundred of people throughout, let's say, two years, mm. and that is usually the shocking moment, the wow moment, when you realize actually, most hospitality business. I mean, you know, except your Michelin star restaurant, your 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 destinational sort of you know, cocktail bar that you you know, as Michael might go once a year for a special celebration or a few times in your life. I mean, let's take these aside. I'm talking your day to day coffee shops, casual restaurants, bakeries, places you would imagine to visit multiple times a month or at least multiple times uh, during the quarter, they actually rely on a very small amount of people who drive that, you know, that the 20% of customers in terms of individual people who drive probably 80% of your revenue. And, and that actually changes everything when it comes to then your strategy and you're thinking about your business, about your marketing, about where you put your money, about where you actually put your focus. Because if your business, let's say it's a Michelin star restaurant, I mean, an average Joe will go then let's say once in their life to that particular one, you know, maybe a handful, tiny handful of people will go, you know, every quarter, but that's obviously a, a, a very small piece. Their job obviously is I need to get millions of people, individual people through the door over the next couple of years, right? Because I cannot rely on them you know, coming on Saturday, returning two weeks later, very unlikely. But if I'm a coffee shop, if I'm a bakery, if I'm a casual restaurant, my job is actually to make sure that, that, a few, that those few hundred of people, a community of local workers, worker residents, whatever that is, A, visit me as often as possible. So we don't just call them, oh, great, they are regulars. How can you make sure those regulars who come every two weeks start coming every one week on average? We, so we could theoretically double that revenue from the same amount of people. And then Sally, if we could double that revenue from these few hundred of people who come multiple times throughout the month, how, how big the jump of revenue can suddenly be? How can we make sure that, you know, your few hundred of regulars, instead of just buying a coffee every morning, buy a coffee and a sandwich every second time? How can we make sure that they bring the families, the friends, all these little things, these actually very minor changes can suddenly mean, you know, a huge difference in your revenue. But it also go, go, goes both ways, right? The same things, small issues, small mistakes. I mean, I, I once counted, we were looking at a business at a coffee shop, local coffee shop, around 350 sort of regulars who drove tens of thousands of transactions over, over, the, first, over the first sort of year. And, and they were really like a key part of the revenue base. Obviously, like we can't possibly always capture every single regular, but it, it's a representative number. And then we calculated this, that throughout the year, if you were to lose two customers a week from those customers, right? So we're talking two customers who didn't like the service, we didn't like the coffee, ended up going elsewhere, changed the habits, whatever that is, you actually are likely to shut down your business because you won't be able to, 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 to make, make, like make it anymore. Because that would be, you know, anything between these two or three customers, anything between 100 and 150 customers from those 300 something that were driving significant part of your revenue. So again, it's, it's, it's pretty eye opening, but that's, but that's, again, you can only do this and, 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 and that's something I would love to, I guess, stress today you can only do this with the right tools. Um, and without it, it's impossible. No matter how great service you give as a waiter, as a barista you can give all the love to the customer and he will come back. Hospitality will always be about that, you know, special personal connection will always be about the food, the drinks, no technology will or should ever change that. But you need tools to A, facilitate that experience, B, make that experience scalable, C, make it measurable and have tools to improve your business based on the incredible product experience you're giving. 
because guess what? You're not the only one who, 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 who thrives to give that experience. And the only way to get competitive advantage is to understand what works and what doesn't work and, and, and have tools to actually improve these things. So again, I would really love to stress that. I mean, I'm sure this will come in the conversation, but, but there are some wow moments in terms of how loyalty can be perceived. It's, it's not just giving away loyalty points. It, it, it's so much more. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting in, in my journey and, and especially the work we've done here at Hospitality Maverick, we, when we really find what we call a maverick business, business that is profitable, makes positive impact on people, communities, and planet over a long period. It's like longevity. It's a little bit like mm -hmm. when you invest in your health. You know, if you want to live long, you need to, you know, get your sleep, eat it well, drink a lot of water and lots of plants and all those things. And the same for these organizations. They're actually looking at that, you know, loyalty piece, a very small group of people with the following. And Kevin Kelly also wrote a, a piece that called A Thousand True Fans which really was distributed by Tim Ferriss after he discovered it. But it's about how do you actually make sure you understand who's, who these thousand are and how you surf. And it could be in some examples, as you say, a couple of hundreds, there's the true fans, but how do you then serve them and how do you know you are serving them? And I think, you know, anyone that runs a business or podcast in my sake, I think this is the hardest sometime to find the right data point and actually knowing if you're doing consistently the right thing to keep them happy because they are the foundation of your business. When they disappear, the followers or the, the late adapters also disappear because they are looking at yeah. what the, the true fans are doing. So we're coming back, back to Embargo. So what problem is it? Because there's no doubt about we are, we are circling around loyalty. We're circling around the, the, the true fans, the 20% to get 80%. But what problem is Embargo really solving in hospitality and, and what has the journey been and what kind of breakthrough have you seen with, with customers? Sure. I mean, to give maybe a bit of context for that answer, like I'll, I would love to also give a little bit of an overview of what the product is so that it's quite easy to imagine the problem and the solution. So what Embargo ultimately is, is on one hand, a simple loyalty app. From a user perspective, day to day, for you, it will be that wallet, that digital wallet on your phone. We have, you know, your loyalty card from the gentleman baristas, maybe your favorite coffee shop there. Maybe your, you know, your loyalty card will be there as well from your honey pokey. For, from a few of your lunch places, bakeries, coffee shops, all in one place. So you just download the app once and you can store your favorite loyalty cards there. Nothing groundbreaking, but simplicity was key for us, which I'll cover in a second. And, and what's key there as well is that although it's one app, every brand has its own sort of feeling of the loyalty card. It's almost like their own apps on our wallet. It, it, it makes sure there's some consistency on the user journey and, 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 and maximize adoption. There's a bit of a network effect as well in terms of usability. And what's important on loyalty card is ultimately very simple to what you would imagine having as a, in, a, in a paper form, but it's digitized. This is also to ensure that introducing a tech solution doesn't suddenly mean disturbance and chaos in your service or suddenly requires your consumers to understand new things because as I mentioned a few minutes ago, hospitality will always be about a great food, great drinks, great service, and that should never be taken away. So by us replicating what people are already used to and making it much more powerful for both the business and more like it well, was easier and, and more rewarding for the consumer, this is what we believe is the way forward. You can use the card and you can use that app in store. You can use it for click and collect, you can use it for delivery. So every customer journey is, is, is embedded in that loyalty card. On the other hand, we have a CRM system. This is the, the, the value that the heart that we give to the businesses so that we can turn all these sales channels, all these customer journeys, all that paper card that's now digital into much more than a reward system, a sales channel. We turn it into your, your most powerful data engine. Focus on regulars, focus on that 20% of customers that deliver 80% of revenue. And we build it in a way where we ensure that every data collected we know it's, it's high value data because it's, it's created and connected by our system. It's not outsourced of 20 other third parties solutions. It's actually our data. We know exactly where it's coming from. We have a context for it to be valuable because if I sign up as a consumer, I want to be part of a loyalty system. I want to leave my data. I make a conscious decision to do this. It's not a, you know, random survey where I just leave my fake email address just to get something. It's a much more personal experience of that data capture. So we present all that data and help businesses understand it through 
very easy to read uh, summaries, insights, suggestions, and we give them multiple marketing tools so that even if, you know, an operator maybe doesn't have a marketing team or the marketing team is quite small, or maybe they, they're not really into digital tech, they can still use this within a few clicks in a few minutes a month to communicate directly with their consumers, to retain them, to actually do more consumer relationship building outside of the menu that they ever thought they could po possibly do. So I think that product and, and, and the form what it's now is very much the result of first, the problem that we saw, which is as a business owner, as a business manager, as a head of marketing, I have very little understanding who my loyal customers are. I know I have them. I, you know, when I'm in the shop, I see them. I actually have very little understanding of how many do I have? How many stop coming? How many used to come weekly and now come maybe only twice a month? When do they drop? Why do they drop? And very little tools to just simply start communicating. So everything I would put on Instagram that just ends up somewhere there, out there, in the middle of a gazillion other posts, how can I send this directly to my key customers? How can I send an offer maybe specifically to people who used to visit and buy from me, but stopped doing so for the last two months? So very tangible data and very tangible tools that can directly show you this is how you can improve your business. So not complicated uh, solutions, not complicated setups, just very straightforward. Let's, let's start driving loyalty. Let's start driving business and let's start using data that's actionable. And it started with that issue and sort of, you know, how do we get to that solution? But it really evolved through one of the key rules that we have at Embargo is we build a product with our customers. We've always said, we know a little bit, I mean, I have a hospitality background, but we always try to think like we don't know anything about industry. We don't know anything that we should be building. The only people that can tell you what they need are our customers. And we are now in that unique position where there's like, I mean, something around one and a half thousand businesses or venues on the platform. There's hundreds of thousands of people which are their regulars who join the app by getting all of like some of those businesses loyalty cards. We can really understand by talking to them, by analyzing the data, the usage of what is it that they need in what form would they like this communication channels to be, to be presented to? Do they prefer push message or an email? If it's a push message, how, how do they want this to be scheduled? What is important to them? If it's offers, how, how, what are the key TNCs or settings or like to see? If it's reporting, what reports do you need? Because a reporting system for a small coffee shop will be different than, you know, a chain of 20, 30, 50 locations or a corporate that, you know, a holding company that owns several brands. So you can really build and adjust that product and create several layers depending on the needs of so many different businesses. So everything we build is, is sort of an ongoing journey of adding, improving and developing the product of what our customers need but also as their needs change over time. I strongly believe that if you build a solution in 2020 or 2019 and, and just leave it there, you just build it. Let's say I'm building an app now for this brand. It will be, you know, Michael's Coffee Shop, loyalty app and CRM. And I don't touch this for the next couple of years, just fix a few bucks. I can tell you today it will be a useless tool because the needs for hospitality business in 2019, maybe some overview needs, like I want to talk to customers, drive retention are the same. But the way you get there is completely different. The context is completely different. The, the world has changed so much since then. So again, we can always be on the forefront. And this is why we believe that being so close to our customers allows us to constantly be in the leadership position and always think like if in a year we look at our product that we have today and we don't go like, how the hell do we even function with such a poor product? That means we haven't been developing it fast enough. This is our actual internal little rule that whatever we do, if we look at it from a year, year back, we need to almost think like, oh, that was almost embarrassing because this is the only way you can always keep on pushing forward and create the best products that your customers possibly want and need. We'll never get it right. We'll never get it perfect, but we can always strive to get there. So, 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 so I think, you know, to, to just, to just really in a nutshell, to summarize what, what embargo helps to do is get to know your regulars outside of the shop, understand how they interact with you, have a direct communication channel with them, drive loyalty without, you know, having to just give away 
paper cards and build your own apps that will cost you a lot of, you know, again, will not be updated for years and ultimately will just damage your brand. How can we really focus on what you do best, which is talking to customers, selling to customers and building relationships? Because as hospitality businesses, that's really what, what your job is about. And we'll give you tools to simplify that. And what we set out as a mission, again, learning this the hard way first and also based on some other, I would say, a graveyard of solutions in our space that, 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 that tried similar solutions and failed before, is how can we, A, make this technology so easy to adopt, so accessible that it doesn't require a major chain to adopt this, but also doesn't require, even if it's a small business, weeks and months of integration, implementation, and you know, a manager that is super tech savvy. How can we make sure that any size business who just wants to do more, who wants to communicate with customers, wants to capture data and use it to drive business, wants to drive loyalty, can use it and can use it within 48 hours to 72 hours. How can you make it affordable for those businesses? And how can we ensure the consumers, on the other hand, finally get a solution that doesn't feel like overwhelming? Because at the end of the day, even if I love my morning coffee, even if I love the brand that serves it to me, that's just a few minutes of my day. I'm not going to dedicate my entire attention. I'm not going to try to figure things out that are too complicated for the sake of that few minutes. So simplicity, 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 and then accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. These are the two key pillars of how we build a product from the business and, and consumer side. And I think any technology in hospitality should be doing this if we really want to make an impact and really do it on a big scale. It's really interesting, the whole friction with these loyalty apps. I have a couple of them myself on the phone and when they don't work or I, I have to navigate too much around it, I'm, I'm not participating in the loyalty. I'm just saying, I don't have the time. I'm standing there, need to pay. And there's also the stress of somebody behind me and I might have my children with me. So that would just, it's like really important to think about how you simplify this for, for the customer to really participate in that. I think that's really interesting because often they become these very complicated and massive monsters that a small business don't even need. You know, you need 20% of the tools to 80% of the work. Yes. You mentioned as you were talking something with relationship and I started this interview with talking about, we're going to be talking about how you build better relationship with your, your core customers. How good are we that? In, in hospitality, what is the state of, you know, our relationship with, and, I'm, and of course, we're not talking about that individual employee where you come into the coffee shop because that's something they have and that's great, but we also know when they leave somebody that sometimes that customer goes with you. I've seen that running a coffee chain myself where there's some specific baristas, people with a relationship and they were not there that day, they wouldn't order coffee, for example, if they're on holiday or something like that, because they only wanted, for example, Robert. To, to make yeah. that coffee for them. We'd say, you know, when you thought, when yeah. I thought that, that's crazy, they all trained in the same way, but then had the, he the only one that could hit the milk like that, for example. But I'm talking about the, the bigger relationship with the, with the brand. I think it, there's a huge, like, you know, I mean, they're the extremes. I think there's some brands who do it very well. I think there's some brands who always manage to stay, you know, on customers' minds. And there are some who literally do nothing. For me, a great example, actually, of the change in, in the mentality, in you know that sort of effort made to build custom relationships outside of the shop, are two brands, like from the big ones. It's Pratt and Joe and the Juice. Joe and the Juice, I know a little bit from the inside. I remember when I first started working, I mean, just as a barista, like barista juice maker first, then late had a chance to be a training manager, get involved a little bit more into the general idea of what the UK market is supposed to look like. I remember I kept on being very annoying to the country manager back then. Actually, two, you know, two of them. One is, I think, still with the company. Uh, incredible guy, Rasmus. And I kept on saying, guys, like you should do so much more. Like, why don't you? that have a proper Instagram account at least. Let's do some more communication. Let's do some more community marketing with, with, with local businesses, with local audiences uh, around the shop. Let's do some events, you know, outside to, 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 to present how cool the brand is. Let's be on people's minds, not just when they're installed buying the juice, but so much further because you have such an unbelievable brand to, to, 
to, to, to talk about, to, to, to share. Like I was so addicted to it. I thought it, 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 it's unbelievable. And I was like, I want everyone to know this. And, and I think that was coming more from, from the, you know, top office that really sort of like conviction saying, no, 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 no. You know, our product is great. We just open the stores and everything will run. Like we just need to find good locations, serve good product, minimize waste. And that's our job to do. And I thought, yes, that's part of the job to do. But again, we're sitting on that potential that we're not unlocking. And obviously now it has changed. If you look at, you know, that was whatever, nine, eight, eight, eight nine years, 10 years ago, they didn't do anything. And now they're probably one of the most active brands that do fantastic social media. A lot of events outside the stores presenting the brand partnerships with, with, with other similar cool lifestyle brands in other industries. They have an app, probably one of the best actually, you know, and, I, and I rarely speak highly of white label solutions because a lot of them are just terrible in, in all honesty. I'm sorry to say that, but they really done a good job. And, 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 you know, the first version wasn't that great, but they really put effort to, to, to make it great. They constantly communicate through that, through that yeah. app. They constantly put specific offers, specific items out there. They are selling new products. They're always in the consumer mind. And then the other one is Pratt. I think there was a podcast. I don't want to lie which, which, which podcast uh, that was, but um, the original founder of Pratt was there. And, and that was a podcast from, you know, a while ago. And, and, and I remember him constantly saying, you know, how Pratt is supposed to be this you know, all about Insta relationships. They don't, they, they just want to do this random act of kindness. I'm, I'm sure you've got it sometimes as well. You walk into the Pratt and the guy will just give you other coffees and meat. And, and it, it is all great. It's fantastic. It is definitely a nice feeling to get this. But I'll, my, my, my question always was, is great, but it, it, it's, it's only good to a certain extent because I personally realized that there were stores where if there was a member of staff who just liked me, for whatever reason, I would just get a free coffee every week, if, if, if not more often. But then if I went to another Pret who, who actually didn't know me, I, I wouldn't get anything. And, but then my brand loyalty is still, is still should be with, with Pret as a business. And also like, I would never really be connected to Pret outside of actually being there and passing it by. And of course, this strategy was always, let's open as many Pret's on every high street as possible. Let's as have more presence Starbucks and Nero's or, or Leon's there. So we'll always be the first one to go into. But I also always thought they had this unbelievable branding, really cool brand sort of language that we're using. Like everything was so meticulously prepared in store. But then I was like, why are you not being out there? Why are you not build, you know, at least some consumer base of people who actually visit you every day? Why don't you use them to understand what else can you do to be better? Opening 20 stores on a high street next to another is not really a solution. It works when there's a lot of free capital, right? And the streets are full. And I think it was the pandemic when they realized, I mean, look, I'm, I'm an outside observer. I might be completely wrong. But how I see it as a consumer is like, great. So suddenly pandemic hit. Both of the stores were pretty much empty. They reopened. Tells that people don't work five times a week anymore from their offices. So a lot of the sites actually weren't as busy or they, 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 they didn't need as many sites, but also they reopened and they didn't have a single customer to contact, say, hey, we're back open. Why don't you pop in for a free coffee or a 50% of sandwich? There was nothing out there. And, and I think that really that, that hit them where for so many years, they served, I don't know, millions and millions of customers probably. They couldn't speak to one single person. They, they, they haven't built a relationship outside of them walking in and buying the coffee over the counter. I mean, it's madness when you think about a business of that size, right? But I loved how they reacted to this. And of course, they learned it the, the, the hard way. But then they went, great, let's start with the subscription. Then let's launch the loyalty app. They really now are on the forefront of trying to push this. I mean, they worked you know, with Eagle Eye, which are also fantastic people who, who, who build incredible systems for more grocery side of things of the business. So I, was, I think that was the, one of the first hospitality projects for them. But... It's really suddenly understanding I need to do more. And, and now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, they actually lost me as a customer. So, so I rarely go there anymore. You know, also we have such a great choice of independent or speciality groups that we work with that, you know, I, I fell in love with their product. But also because they have done so much more in the last couple of years to connect with me, to communicate with me, regardless of my relationship with them as a, as embargo, but just 
send me a push message. Let me know about a new, new offer on a new product. They always stepped at the, at the forefront. Actually, that, you know, a lot of these small businesses we work with have done more than Fred has done for maybe, you know, five, 10 years pre-pandemic. And, and I think this is amazing how, how they changed, how they're now on the forefront, how them joined the juice, McDonald's, they're all sort of the evangelists in the industry saying, we need to capture data. We need the digital solution. We need to drive, drive sales for, for our own channels. We need to build relationships outside of it. And I think they've done a tremendous job and I'm sure they'll keep getting better and better. But then the question is, that's, you know, a small percentage of the market. There's international chains of hundreds of thousands of stores, but then there's 60, 80% of the market, which are SMEs, anything between one and 20, some 50, some hundred stores. What do they do? They can't possibly spend millions and millions to do it so well as they've done it because they have spent a tremendous amount of money, hired a lot of people to just do that one thing, which is the digital loyalty, CRM and customer relationships. Like at that point, what can they do? And, and this is the question that arises. How can, how can whether us or other solutions bring something that can launch overnight, that can be manager of one person, not necessarily a team of 20. How can we make sure that it means zero tech work, zero tech understanding, and nothing they have to do outside of the main focus, which is selling incredible foods, drinks, working on the experience, working on the branding and communicating with customers. And I think this is where we work so hard to come in. Is that solution for the, you know, 60 to 80% of the market to really take this by storm and be this, you know, biggest friend in the journey of, 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 of building what well, these guys are building for a lot of money with, with big and bigger success. It's really interesting when you talk about Fred and I think lots of hospitality felt they were totally, there was no connection with customers when the pandemic hit and that was when they had to build that thing. And you saw some of them had a incredible, I think there's a great example. I don't know if you, Pizza Pilgrim did, did this kind of pizza thing where they send the whole pizza mm -hmm. box home so you can make your own pizza at home and then take pictures. It's the same time. They got lots of, lots of, you know, customer created content, you know, and these raving pizza pilgrim fans just went mental. They never thought they would sell so many pizzas. I had Tom, one of the founders on the podcast talking about this, where they were absolutely surprised to put down, you know, and that's in a way, and that loyalty then when they open back up, because they had the email list where people could then exactly. say, we back open, you come and have your special pizza, 50% on us or whatever they did. I can't remember the, the, the semantics of it. It was really, really interesting that they already had this group of raving fans on email and they spent the, the, the pandemic of really expanding that relationship. And they just on their 10 years birthday party where, you know, customers had a special day where they were invited and, you know, making these outside events, as you say, as well, that's not to do with serving you in a restaurant, but actually mm -hmm. a special thing. And they've done, just done another video about the pimp pilgrimage in, in Italy, where they do go down again. It's just interesting how they really scale story, yeah. but I'm sure they do it all. They know exactly what they need to do to make that impact by their super fans. Because like, I get excited when I see these videos because I am an absolute fan of them as well. Like mm -hmm. my kids, that's where they want to go when we have pizza, because that, that's just how it is, you know, and they are more premium product, but you also get, you feel that you are buying into something and you get that good experience every time. And then you are following them. You're following them in a different way and you build that relationship. And I think there's, there's company in other industries. I'm often thinking about Southwest Airlines. I found out what 20% of 80% of their customers should focusing on. That was like business customers that just want great hospitality and they delivering that at a very low cost price in a way. Yeah. So yeah, there's so, so many interesting things to think about when you start this 2080 and who you need to build relationship with. And then you can become creative about how you do that. How do we actually mm -hmm. excel in that? Can you share some of the breakthroughs that has been happening with some of your customers as they started using these tools, disciplines, and principles you have implemented into the platform? What happens when they start? Because they, I guess they have a problem. Either they want a loyalty system or they want the data you've been mentioning a number of times. But what happens after they start implementing the tool and 
let's talk about somebody that really are disciplined about it and said, okay, we're going to do this right. We're going to focus as we implement the tool. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I already mentioned is actually realizing that a lot of those businesses rely on a pretty small amount of customers, which is ter- like incredibly loyal and, and, and just come so often, but it's not really thousands of people. And, and I think what that changes, I mentioned the strategy is a lot of these people realize what's the point of me spending, you know, crazy amounts of money for, for the scale of the business on Instagram ads, on, you know, creating millions of videos that you, you then start to sponsor and sort of get out there. Because at the end of the day, you, you're very likely not to have a whole growth marketing team who will then measure everything and run these campaigns and, and A-B test content and everything. Because you, if, if you go with an ad on Instagram, you're competing against the biggest brands in the world. Because if they want yours, Michael's attention when you scroll through Instagram, I don't know, Nestle will want your attention. Airbnb will want your attention. Hundreds of fashion brands will want your, your, uh, your attention. Restaurants, coffee shops, every possible consumer brand that somehow is connected to your likes, to your interests, will bet their money to get on your feet, to get on your story, whatever that is. Now, this is an extremely difficult war to take. And now you think how much effort and money is to go into it to actually even, even come close to remotely competing with all of these huge teams that all they do is literally Instagram and, and social media campaigns and, and strategy. And then what is the pot- potential outcome? Because in all honesty, if I see a, a local bakery coffee shop popping up on my Instagram, great, I see it. I might even like the picture because it's nice. By the time I stop scrolling, I probably forgot what it's called. Even if there was great, beautiful content. But then even let's say I remember, what, how can I interact with it now? You know, if it's a fashion brand, I can go click on the store and, and, and order from them, right? Like, oh, I want to order those, those jeans or, or book a trip because it was this beautiful resort, right? Oh, great. I can book for holidays. It's not that I'm going to see this and I'll drop everything and run to that coffee shop, which I don't even know where it is actually from that place, right? So it's almost like this is not your business. This is not you trying to capture random people out there to come and run to your local bakery, coffee shop, even a quick service restaurant. And even if you have multiple sites, doesn't matter. You realize that your job is community marketing. Is how can I move those people walk in and walk out as people in my CRO, my loyalty card? How can I then see how they interact with me and how can they communicate with me? And now some examples. So um, we're working with a uh, with fantastic uh, specialty coffee shop chain. They joined us throughout the pandemic at some point. I mean, hundreds of thousands of different transactions already made through, through embargo, like coffee stamps, redeem rewards, orders for pickup, delivery, et cetera. And it's been now probably like two years or something like that. And we looked recently at the data um, and they, they've done a lot of things throughout the time. I can mention a few, but we look at the data, the average time between visits for those customers historically throughout that two years has been 13 days. Obviously that impacts pandemic. If we detect the pandemic, I think it was around nine days or so. But if we look at just this year or last quarter, et cetera, it's between four and seven days. So you see that that sort of, because they stayed constantly on the forefront of, of the customer's mind by sending regular push messages, driving exclusive offers for the loyalty card members, launching, click and collect and delivery from the loyalty card. So they, so they done a tremendous job of capturing that data of these, of these regulars, then communicating with them, making sure they're always the first one to find out about any news, any products, any offers. What it meant is that they embedded the brand and that experience in their head almost every day or every week, which means that I don't just go there because I was going anyway. It's, it's like, I almost feel like I want to go more because I feel a bit closer to that brand. I'm almost prompted because all you need is if I go there once a week to, to a venue for my coffee, because that's how I set up. I maybe work from the office now three times a week, but once a week I go there to grab my, you know, favorite slab white of, on, on old milk. But now because some regular communication, I was presented the option to also try the incredible new sandwiches. Maybe there was a special deal with, with, with the new pastries or cakes. 
they managed to remind me and put a new product on my lips. And as I started to understand that, and as I started to be communicated about this, it, it starts changing habits because suddenly maybe I would go there for my coffee, but then also once a week for my lunch to try the, because I fell in love with the sandwiches and I love to have them with my coffee in the morning because suddenly, because I'm constantly on the forefront when I'm getting ready in the morning at home, I'm, I can suddenly start thinking, maybe I will not make myself breakfast right now. How about I grab it on the way to work? Because actually they've now told me three times I've tried it once. It's fantastic. Let's try it again. So obviously it's never done overnight. It's never done, you know, with one campaign, but it's a continuous communication and staying on top of people's mind when it's crucial. And, and then suddenly those customers that used to come, you know, on average, every 13 days, now maybe they visit on average every four days. And that's a major difference for the business. So that's obviously like one of many, many sort of cases. We've had some customers telling us that after implementing the solution, the sales would grow between 15 and 20%. Of course, I know we don't have access to all their sales and, and, and to all the reports. So uh, I can only rely on their, on their words. But what we love about the product is that because we're, we are pioneers and we aren't. We aren't pioneers in terms of bringing a low CRM solution. But I think the way we do it fully from A to Z, from A to Z is, 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 is pretty new and definitely new for a lot of businesses we serve. They come up with a lot of incredible ways how to utilize that tool. One example, which I never thought it could be the case, it wasn't a UK example, but it was a bakery who was very close to a school. It was a primary school, middle school, and high school, like sort of a one complex of buildings. And what they realized is that there's a huge market of these kids who want to grab a sandwich, want to grab a snack every now and then, especially on the break. And, you know, especially the older ones who are allowed to leave, you know, at the premises throughout, throughout, the break, throughout the break. And obviously a lot of parents don't always feel comfortable with giving cash to the kids, right? Because especially when they're teenagers, you don't know what they're going to do with it, et cetera. So they set up this, this thing where they would sell for the loyalty card. So I'm, I'm a parent. I have, a loyalty, I have the loyalty card. I could buy at the, at, the, at the bakery a sort of like a special gift card that would unlock X amount of sandwiches. So I'd prepay for it. And then, and then how it would work is then the bakery would just provide specific codes, unique codes that they could just give it to the kids. The kid enters it in their own card, in their own loyalty app. And then they have, for example, 10 sandwiches to redeem. And as they come, they also may, you know, become afterwards a regular customer. So they're also building a new generation of customers locally, but they use actually our loyalty card and, and sort of promo code functionality to start catering to these hundreds of kids <laughs> to, buy, to, to, to basically get the sandwiches that are prepaid by the, by the parents. And so that was one of my favorite completely random idea. I never even thought that our tool can be used for. And yeah, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, of course, but that's the thing. It just opens up for the first time a set of tools that you can really cater to the needs and to the specification of your business because every coffee shop, every bakery is slightly different and we embrace that. What would be your, you know, your top advice to, to leaders out there that is building a, for, a business as well for good? So I already mentioned a business that's profitable and also make positive impact in the community the above. Because we're also talking about relationship and thereby you talked about community marketing, which I thought was a very interesting concept. What would your top advice be to them? Well, yeah, first of all, under, try to understand who your customers are and build the product so that it really solves their problem. Like focus even, even on that niche first, because if you'll be extremely successful in that niche, you'll get more and more interest from other niches. And sometimes that niche in a big market is still a major multi-billion market to go after. For us personally, and something we learned the hard way as well, when we first launched Embargo, we were like, great loyalty, let's do it for cocktail bars, high-end restaurants, nightclubs, coffee shops, everyone, because everywhere is loyalty. Yes, it is. But loyalty for a coffee shop is different than loyalty for a cocktail bar. And at the beginning, we need to build a product that is the, po the possibly best solution for the, you know, one niche. And we focus first to start our coffee shops, bakeries, quick service, restaurants, delis, anywhere where it's quick serve at the counter. I mean, it can be at the table, but pretty casual where you can imagine yourself going several times a week or at least several times a month. 
Now, what, that, what does that mean? That means that the interface needs to look a little bit different. With that being said, we still work with bars who then started contacting us or, you know, even now, although we don't actively probably go out there and sell to big bar groups or, or pub groups, they do contact us because it can work for them as well. It's just that because we nailed it, create so much success in, in that specific segment, which, you know, is tens of thousands of businesses in each country, actually. So, so, you know, multi-billion market to go after in each country. Well, what we then do, we adapted the user interface, the, 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 the functionalities and the tools for them. And then as we were getting also then within that niche, different type of verticals, like big businesses, small businesses, office led businesses, residential businesses, we could, you know, because there's already so much complexity even within that niche in terms of how they operate, we could then focus on serving those customers within that niche, depending on the different type of businesses. We didn't have to do this also for the high end Michelin star restaurants and the nightclubs and et cetera, because they're completely different beasts. And that also means is we can come with much better advice to them because we can become experts. We can go, look, yes, if you're a coffee shop, you can have your 10th coffee free as a loyalty system. But probably if you're a pizzeria doing your 10th pizza free, I'm not sure. We can really tell you that. I don't think it's going to work because I can go to my coffee shop probably three, four times a week. I'll get a free coffee definitely within my first month. 10 pizzas from the same pizzeria. Even if I love it, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, you love pizza pilgrims. You know, you might, okay, you might be ordering for your kids as well, but let's say you are that average day-to-day -day customer. How long will it take you to buy 10 times from pizza programs? No matter how great it is, I love the pizza as well, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it will take me months and months and months. Then again, is this something I'm willing to like embrace as a consumer? That feels like ages ago, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do in, in, in a few months, where I'm going to live. So, so again, we can then become you know, experts to say for coffee shop, this for pizza places, that for burger places, this for bake for bakeries, that because loyalty is an often used word out there. Everyone thinks they do loyalty, but it's actually a very complex subject and you need to t really apply the right loyalty strategies for the type of business you have. So one thing is really nail your ideal client profile and be obsessed with serving them and be obsessed with the little details that make each of these businesses different and try to solve them, but be obsessed with that. And I think the second more general thing um, is just follow your own path. Take all the advice, you know, take everything that's out there to be inspired with and make it greater, but make it your own thing. Just because you'll see 20 LinkedIn posts about, I don't know, how you have to raise a 5 million seed round before you even launch a product because, you know, the best, the best founders get pitched by VCs of the other way around. It's bullshit. It's utter bullshit. And, and th maybe that was a, a journey for some of the successful businesses, but then there is a gazillion other successful businesses that had a completely different journey. Don't get too tied up with, you know, a few sort of wannabe inspirational or wannabe educational posts or content out there and think you need to follow that journey. Your business, your journey might be completely different. It might take you five, 10 years to get, I don't know, to one, two million ARR. But then, you know, you might become, you know, a hundred million ARR profitable with a 30%, 40% margin. Whereas there are businesses who go to 1 million ARR in a year and they shut down in year two. So it's like, there's a lot of successes that don't need to be the success factor for you or the benchmark for you because your journey is different, your business is different. It's the same way, like every coffee shop, a, a pizzeria, burger place, restaurant is different. You know, have the same thinking about than your business comparing to others. Yeah, I think it's a, I love that, you know, because you're always on your own path. If it's your business and you, your life, you know, you should spend less thing, time and thinking about what others do and what they did to achieve success. You should, of course, get inspired and take the tools and disciplines and, you know, mindsets and all that, but you still have to make it your own. And that's the mean you need to put it into the doing and actually accept that you're on your own journey and the patient bit. You know, really the most important business is patient. I found over the years, uh, sometimes it's really hard to, to accept that because you get very impatient, probably with yourself first and then with others. And that's actually where it starts to go really, really wrong. And then you need to go back to, okay, what am I in control of? What can I do now? What can I push forward today? That 1% better than yesterday. What is the, the one question you wish I've asked you, Frederick, which I didn't do? And what would it be? And what is your answer 
what do I see as the key reasons for us to, you know, triple in size and sort of revenue customers in the last like one and a half, a bit more than one and a half years? Mm-hmm. Was actually was also the probably most challenging one and a half years or two years for for startups, for a lot of businesses. And I think that question is probably, you know, you can answer it in, in, in a few quick quick words, but also can they can deeper. I try to find something in between. We've always had an approach that although we are a tech startup, we have investors, we knew we'll have to raise a few rounds, et cetera. We always try to focus on cash efficiency and also focus on how can we build a profitable, sustaining um, business that solves a problem or provides value that isn't based on some, you know, immediate hype, isn't based on, you know, a very short-term pro- like problem. Like, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've seen a lot of different uh, startups go out there solving a very pandemic-focused <laughs> issue, which, you know, I personally always saw a very short-term solution. Of course, yeah, they, 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 they grew with crazy pace within the first six months, one year of launching, raising hundreds of millions, et cetera. But then, you know, it was all short term. So I think for us, it was always, although it was a bit dangerous because, you know, you, you almost were tempted and be like, should we also then adapt to that, to this? Like, because we could then launch this product or that product and then grow crazy and, and, you know, show the same growth. But then, although we stay true to us being, we want to be covering loyalty, we want to be covering transactions, CRM data, all the sort of operation between the business and the consumer that hasn't really been covered before. You have EPOS systems, you have payments on the back end, inventory, that's all covered fantastically in that industry. But on the front end, there are very little tools out there who can help you build that relationship in a sustainable way. They can, they can cover every possible, you know, customer journey or as many customer journeys while still keeping the data very usable, actionable, and high quality. How can we stay true to this? What we're doing that everything we do has to be loyalty retention centric because we believe that's the success factor for any hospitality business driving loyalty, driving retention. And how can you make it data driven? So we have the CRM building on the back of it. So although we obviously then during the time where COVID hit, when a lot of businesses were opening, closing, you know, a lot of businesses we couldn't charge, you know, our growth was somehow like difficult to push. We had to show a lot of patience. A lot of, you know, desire to just keep on going no matter what. But we like in the long term, this is the solution we need. And we said even more after the pandemic, as obviously we now see with all the big brands we discussed, the whole market will realize like deeper and a deeper and deeper meaning how important what we do is for their business and we'll be the winners. It was like we bet on that sort of long term value we can give and long term success we can build for ourselves rather than jumping on that sort of, you know, flavor of the day. And, 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 and this was so, so key for us. And I think second of all, something, you know, we, we, I think once briefly discussed in our chat a couple of weeks ago is the whole, how setbacks, challenges, problems make us stronger. And, and, and I think, you know, some of the best businesses have grown out of crises, like same, if you look at 2007, 2009, and then what startups came out of that period and, you know, your, your unbelievable products that we still use today, we felt like that all these challenges, all these setbacks that came from, you know, the pandemic, the, 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 the you know, rising living costs, banks shutting down, et cetera, you know, lack of funding or like a very little funding available, less funding available in the last sort of year or so, how we become, became stronger as a team, as a business, as founders. And, and it almost feels like the further we go, the easier it is to overcome those unexpected challenges. So yeah, so, so, so it was those key things, just staying really true to our vision whilst being constantly obsessed with improvement because staying true to your core and keep keeping sort of on track with your vision doesn't mean you don't change, you don't pivot, you don't, you don't, you don't improve, you don't like play around and test things. Part of the job is to do this 24 seven, but it's about what's the direction you're going, you know? So you don't suddenly jump all the other way. And of course, if, if you feel the business needs a pivot, you pivot. And that's part of the founder's journey as well to have, to have the guts to do it. For us, it was to say, we, you know, throughout the pandemic, we only focus on quick service restaurants, coffee shop delis is our main go-to market um, uh, sort of strategy. 
and and that was a big pivot for us, sort of, because before we're like bars, pubs, restaurants, everything, and a little bit coffee shops. Now we're like, you know, this is this is our niche. This is what we what we invest at. We can strongly go and say we're the best product for you. And then again, just 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 becoming stronger as a team and using the setbacks as as a training ground. <laughs> but I guess it's like life. You need uh, skills. You need to 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 to. to be good in business you don't start in being good in, and you probably never will master all different areas of business acronym because that's why you put together a team but again yeah. like you have to achieve that master and the same is that what i've learned myself when you go to market you really need to you know try the lean startup mythology find out where your minimal viable product gets most attention and excite and then you have to say that's it that's exactly. where we're going to achieve mastery and then it will overspill. There will be other that will be interested. But, you know, trying to force a solution into people that's not ready and where and they're not achieving mastery and really understanding mastery is part of really understanding the, the customer's problems is really, really key. So that was a really, really good question. Where, where can people here uh, in the end, where can they find out more about you if they want to connect with you, Embargo, where, where do they go? What is the best places? Absolutely. I think if they want to connect with me personally, whether it's people who are in the industry and they want to exchange views, whether it's investors, you know, we always take on fantastic, fantastic investors on board. We're actually quite proud of the names that we have as part of our shoulders. Customers saying they want to reach out directly to me, potential venues who just even, you know, though maybe I'm not ready to sign up, I just want to understand more. They can definitely find me on LinkedIn. Frederick Shudlovsky, you can look it up. We're also probably going to share a link to it. We will um, do that. Yeah. Also, if businesses want to just get a more generic information or book a demo with our team, to our website, they can, they can choose the time and date that it works for them. Book a demo on our team will definitely do a good job presenting why we've been so successful at, you know, over one of thousand incredible brands or, or, or venues on the platform. So I, I would say, yeah, LinkedIn and, and our website, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone who is even remotely interested in the subject we cover. Great, great. Thank you so much for your time today. Power and energy to you and the team, Frederick. We will stay in touch. Thank you, Michael. Cheers.